Well, welcome everyone. I'm really glad that you're all here for this session tonight on fake news. My name is Lindsay McCollum. I'm a librarian at the Mount Library. And joining me today is a fellow librarian, Denise. She is going to be in the chat, um, basically just summarizing some of the key points that I make along the way. So what I do want to uh, just to show you before we begin some functions. Um, if you would like to ask a question or if you have a comment, please feel free to type it in the chat box. You can also choose the top or excuse me, the talk button on the top uh, left of the screen if you have a microphone on your computer or laptop. Thank you, Denise. You're so prompt. <laughs> um, I also am going to ask you questions along the way. I would like to sort of have this be a, a more engaging, interactive uh, session. So uh, you can simply use uh, in the left hand bar, the little hand button, it says raise hand. So I'm going to ask some sort of yes or no questions. So if you could please use that when that happens, that would be greatly appreciated. Any questions before I start? OK, we'll go on. So. Before we dive, excuse me, before we dive right in to fake news and all that it contains, I do want to provide you with a little bit of context. So oftentimes when you think about yourself navigating the internet, we tend to think of ourselves as pretty independent and pretty free in how we navigate. We choose which websites to go to, we choose which people to interact with often. And those, we think, um, are independent, our own volition. And this is very much a nice way to think about the internet, but the reality is slightly different. The scenario that I mentioned at the beginning, us navigating on our own through the internet, is really exemplified by the picture on this page on the left-hand side. That's you, and that is all the possible interests or things that you might encounter along the way. The reality, however, is actually this image on the left hand, or excuse me, on the right hand side. It's you, but there's a lot of things surrounding you that is actually tailoring the content that you see towards what it thinks you might want to see. And this is called an online filter bubble. And this is created by a variety of different sites. Um, Facebook and Google are often some of the common examples, um, what they do is that they not only take information about you, some basic things like your age or your gender, but also other things like your entire search history, everything that you've ever looked for. And they take all of that into account and use an algorithm to try and bring back results or show you things that it thinks you might like. Now, in some ways, it's quite nice because it's very personalized. It's tailored to you and your interests. However, there is an alternative issue here, and that is that you don't always know or even see that this is happening. And so therefore, you can't know or see what results are being filtered out. What are you not seeing that maybe you should be seeing? Are you only seeing things that agree with your viewpoint or your beliefs or the way that you think about the world? Or are you seeing things that are contrary, that make you think or maybe make you feel a little bit uncomfortable? So it's quite easy when you are in this shelter bubble to believe that what you see is an accurate representation of not only your world, but the world around you, and that what you see is what everyone else sees as well. Now, I do want to do a quick little test to see what actually happens when we all do this at the same time. So I am going to share my screen, and I would like all of you to go to Google. And we're all going to type in the exact same word and see what kind of results we get back. So let me share my screen with you first.
Okay, so this is Google. Thank you. Okay. So this is Google. And let me just reframe this a little bit so I can see you and I can see the screen. All right. What I'm going to type in is the name of a company. The company is called British Petroleum. I'd like all of you at home to do this exact same search. Okay. Has anyone done their, has, does anyone need more time to do their search? You can just put your other hand up if you do. Okay, we can take another minute. Go to Google and type in British Petroleum. Perfect. All right. These are results that I am getting back for British Petroleum. I have some pages about a career at British Petroleum. I have a Wikipedia page. And I suddenly have some things about it, something called a deep water horizon oil spill. Now, my question is, is there anyone who has a different set of results than I do? Now, that could mean that these results are in a different order. Oh, Elizabeth, perfect. Or it could also mean that you have entirely different results than I do. Or maybe there's a page in there that I don't have. Okay, Tanya has different. Perfect. Megan's the same. Same, okay. Aaron's is different. Okay. Oh, that's interesting, Janet. You had more results. More different order. How many do I have? Oh, that is interesting. You've got 200,000 more results than I do, Janet. Okay, so this is an example of a filter bubble at work. Some of you have different results than I do. Some of you have the same. And this is kind of interesting and a little fun as an experiment. But if you think about yourself at home, alone, doing research, or even just doing whatever you do on the Internet, talking to friends or reading fan fiction, whatever it might be, you don't actually know that what you're seeing is different from what other people are seeing. So we are operating in isolation, believing that what we see is reality, is the truth. And while it is for us in some, to some degree, it could be entirely different for someone else. And that is the effect of a Google filter bubble or any filter bubble that you might encounter on the Internet, is that it happens without your knowledge and it happens without you being able to counteract that or to find something that's outside of what it thinks you want. So that is how a filter bubble works, and that is certainly the result of it. So thank you, everyone, for participating. I appreciate that. All right. I'm going to go back to my slides. So let's move on now and talk a little bit about where we get our news from. And this is when I would like you to use the little hand button on close to the top left corner of your navigation bar. So where do you get your news from? The first option is online news websites. So things like CBC Online, CTV, BBC, CNN. Okay. So some of you do get to know. That's also where I get my news from, mostly. I'll get into that a little bit, though. OK. So next is the newspaper option. Does anyone get their news from the tried and true physical newspaper? Oh, wow. I don't. So kudos to you guys. Okay, thank you. Does anyone get your news from a TV broadcast? 
That could be the traditional 6 o'clock news, perhaps. That could be a 24-hour news channel, something that you see on TV. Okay. Oh, even more. All right. I think this might be the most. And I have noticed a few repeaters, which is good. I'm glad you're getting new sources from different um, different places. It's always a good thing. Does anyone get your news from social media? This could be Facebook. It could be Twitter. It could be Tumblr. Okay, quite a few. Yeah, I actually do get some of my news from these sources as well. Twitter in particular for me. Oh, wow, a lot of you. Okay, this might be the most popular one, which is really interesting to see. Okay, last one. Does anyone get your news from a site that I have not mentioned? Okay, so quite a few actually. Would you mind saying what you get it from? Is it Reddit? Is it something else? <laughs> Hugh uses journal articles. <laughs> well, thank you, Hugh. <laughs> it might be a little dated news. <laughs> Friends? Actually, that's good. Fair point, Hugh. That is fair point. And we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit later in the session. All right. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate that. Vox and... Okay. I've never actually heard of quartz to me, so thank you for that. Lots I have heard of, and I do go to them occasionally. There's so many out there that it's almost impossible for all of us to know every one of them. All right, so moving on and touching on what fake news actually is. Now, as it stands, fake news has kind of become this umbrella term for any news that potentially we might not agree with. Um, sometimes people use it simply to say, I don't like the facts that you're saying, so therefore it must be fake news. But there are some distinctions to make, and I do just want to quickly go over those. So first of all, fake news, as I'm defining it here, means publishing untrue or fake information for financial gain. Sometimes people ask, well, what's the point of fake news? What does anyone get out of it? And truthfully, they can actually get quite a lot of money out of it. And that is the motivation most of the time for fake news. Because any site that has advertising in it, if you create a piece of fake news that gets 5 million people to check that site, then you actually have quite a bit of money coming in. So there is some financial value to actually uh, creating and disseminating fake news. Then there's simply bad news. This could be poorly researched or it could be deliberately misleading reporting. You often tend to see this on sites that are either very far left or very, very far right on the political spectrum. Um, a site that you might be familiar with is, oh, Allison, did you have a question? Or is that just a lingering hand up? Okay, I think it's oh, okay. Okay. Oh, okay. No worries. Thanks. Um, as I was saying, with with bad news or poorly researched or misle misleading news, um, I, I was something that you might have heard of before. It's called Breitbart. It tends to be very far right in its political nature, and it does tend to purposely create and publish pieces that are very misleading, deliberately misleading, in an attempt to create anger or a sense of injustice among a certain type of group. Then there is partisan news. And this is a little bit different. And there is a distinction here. Partisan news, uh, if you think of uh, American news sites like MSB, MSNBC versus Fox News, they are undeadly partisan. They are, tend to be biased towards one side of the political spectrum. MSNBC tends to be uh, more left, while Fox News tends to be more right. Now, what makes this different from bad news, per se, is that certainly these outlets may slant their stories to appeal to a target audience, 
They may cover issues less evenly than more neutral sites would. And they may choose to focus on topics that are a bit more provoking or that create a sense of outrage rather than issues that are, in the grand scheme of things, more important. But that does not mean that they don't use traditional journalistic standards or that they are not using unvetted, or excuse me, or that they are using unvetted sources. They do still operate under the umbrella of a traditional journalist journalistic standards that most news uh, organizations follow. However, because they are so clearly partisan, they do tend to slant one way or another the coverage that they do carry. So those are the distinctions, sometimes a little bit difficult to figure out which is which, but that is something that we're going to cover later on in this session, is how to differentiate between those. Another thing to keep in mind is that fake news is not actually that new. Certainly, we've been hearing a lot about it, um, particularly because of the American election in 2016. But it has existed for far longer than that. I don't know if anyone is old enough to remember, but uh, there is emails that went around in the 90s and the early 2000s that was basically fake news. The difference between then and now, however, is that when it comes to email, you can only email it to addresses that you know. It's difficult to email something to a stranger. Whereas with social media, you have a much further reach than you ever would with email. And that you can very easily spread information much quicker to a wide variety of people, a larger audience, basically. So that is how fake news is much easier to disseminate and certainly to grow in popularity than it was, say, 20 years ago. Another distinction to make is the difference between fake news versus satirical news or parody news. And a good example of this is The Onion, which is a, a pretty popular, and most of you probably heard of it. Um, it is a satirical news site. So when you're talking about satire or parody, you're using humor or irony or exaggeration oftentimes to highlight shortcomings in society. Essentially, you're making fun of something to show how ridiculous it is. And oftentimes, it's almost like um, constructive social criticism. You're criticizing society in order to show the harm that something does, and hopefully to eventually make it right. So sometimes you might encounter something that looks like fake news, but actually it's being written or attempted to be written with a humorous slant. And typically that would be considered satirical or parody news. You will also encounter something that is sort of a gray area. It's not necessarily fake news, but they are sponsored ads. So essentially a news organization will work with a company to write an article that is for profit, and it, what it is doing essentially is it's trying to sell a company's product. And typically it doesn't have anything to do with an organization's editorial team, meaning the team that actually writes and manages the journalistic side of things, but it's more with an, an advertising team. So a team that's designed to actually make money or to sell things in order to make money. So we will see an example of this, um, and we'll go over something to look out for to make sure that you're not mistakenly looking at something that is sponsored rather than an actual article. OK, so now we are getting into how to actually identify fake news. The first thing to consider is where is the story actually published? Now, something very basic to look out for is actually the website URL. The reason why is because oftentimes um, sites that end in .com, .co are actually fake news sites. So an example is um, CBC um, or CBS, like an American one, uh, CBS.com. If someone adds CBS.com, .co to it, that is uh, likely to be a fake news site that is trying to piggyback off that name of CBS 
very well known. People might mistakenly enter that URL. And the content on that site is most likely fake and written to try and generate some income from the advertisements. Another aspect to look out for is actually the website design. As you can imagine, when you are creating and publishing fake news, you're trying to make money. And you're probably not going to throw a lot of money into a very nice, fancy website design that will draw lots of people in. You just want people to click on the link, wherever that link might be. So check out the website design. Typically, these sites are not very well designed. Um, they're not very, they don't have very many interactive options. They don't look nice. And another thing to consider also are the ads. Do the ads actually match up somewhat to the content of the article or the site that you're on? One thing to look out for, if there are ads that look faintly pornographic in nature or if they're trying to sell very cheap video games, I'm pretty sure that that is a fake news site. They're not bringing in high quality ads or high quality companies either. Again, they're a fake news site. They're not trying to draw in um, those quality companies. They're just trying to make uh, a decent book. Another aspect, and this is pretty easy, is to just check the About Us section. Virtually every news organization will have an About Us section. And it will talk about oftentimes the history of the news organization, so perhaps the history of the CBC. It will talk oftentimes about the mandate of the organization. Why does it exist? What is it trying to do with this news coverage? It will probably also mention the heads of the organization. It might mention the editor-in-chief or CEO. Um, and it will likely also have a contact um, detail somewhere, whether it be an email address, whether it be a phone number, tips perhaps. Essentially, this about us oftentimes will allow you to see who actually is in charge, what the goal of the institution is, and if you're still not certain after going to the About Us page, what you can do is simply Google those names. See if those names are showing up in other reports. Are they mentioning those people in a good light, or are they saying these people have actually created a fake website? So that's another easy way to just quickly check to see if the information contained in the About Us section is accurate. Finally, I would search the name of the site and or author to see, it's been, to see if it's been reported on, similar to what I just mentioned about the About Us section. Um, just Googling the name of the site oftentimes will bring up other mentions of it, so other news stories that might have mentioned it, other websites. And you can very quickly gauge if they have been mentioned as a fake news site or if they are a credible resource. Another aspect to, to check on is the story's content. So does the headline of the story actually match the story itself? It's pretty common to try and create these very big, flashy, somewhat angry headlines to draw people in. But then the actual story content, the meat of the story, may not have anything to do with the headline itself, or even maybe even slightly is associated with the headline. But you do want to ensure that there is a uh, commonality between both the headline and the story. This is very, very important. When was the story actually published? What's all too often when it comes to fake news websites is they will take stories written two months ago, two years ago, and simply repackage it and throw it out into the internet, hoping it will stick. So I would always check to see when the story was published. Um, it will also help you determine if what um, events or people mentioned in the story actually happened around that time. So one instance is that I encountered a piece of fake news, um, a story, and it mentioned things like, presidential nominee Hillary Clinton will make these changes once elected. The issue is that it was published on November 11th, 2016, and the election itself happened November 8th, 2016. So if there's someone <laughs> is a time traveler, a really poor time traveler, I'm not sure. Um, but just the basic dates 
could tell me immediately that this is clearly a fake news story. Another very simple, effective way to track the story's content to see if it actually is accurate is to follow any links that are mentioned in the story itself. So if there are embedded links in the article, click them. Follow it through. See what those sources are actually saying and read back the story itself. Do those two things match? Is the outside source accurately represented within this story's content? What's pretty common is fake news sites will link to stories or content in respected places like New York Times or um, Gallup Polling, which is a respected polling organization. So it looks on the surface like it is accurate, credible news, but when you actually click on that link, the story from New York Times is drastically different than what this original site is representing it to be. And I would also finally just look at the scope of the story. What's pretty common, and again, fake news, is trying to draw you in very quickly, so oftentimes we'll use language or concepts that are very, um, well, they oftentimes make you feel something, and usually that feeling is anger or outrage. Are they making broad claims about a certain person or a political party or a group, or do they actually have a very clear, specific focus? Typically, again, this, this isn't real reporting, so it's easy for fake news to get away with simply broad, sweeping, generalized claims without actually diving into any um, needy focus or story. So that is another aspect to consider in conjunction with everything else that has been mentioned here. Are there any questions so far? Okay, let me take a drink so I don't lose my voice. And we'll go on. Now, I don't want to be all gloom and doom and uh, make you spike up all about absolutely everything in the world because there are some things that you can trust, of course. And when I say trust, I always say that with the understanding that being critical, and I don't mean critical for um, to be mean, but evaluating something with a critical mind, that's always going to be a good thing, regardless of what source it is, whether it be an academic peer-reviewed journal or whether it be a CBC news article that you find. Both of them you should approach with a critical lens because both of those, as everything, is run by humans, and no human is perfect, and no human organization is perfect. So there are always going to be some things that slip through the crack. But when we are talking about reputation, about historical um, credibility, there are organizations and publications that you can generally trust. And there are things to determine that trustworthiness. So. Organizations or publications that are generally considered trustworthy or reliable often do the same following things. First of all, they commit to fact-checking their sources and themselves, meaning they often employ something called an ombudsman, and they are upfront about their practices and their methods that they use to gain this information. They also oftentimes admit when they are wrong, meaning that they will issue corrections, or they'll actually do an entire retraction. A retraction is when they pull the story entirely because there is something so horribly wrong with it that they, they just can't redeem it, essentially. Corrections typically will happen within the body of a text, and they will identify at the top or the bottom of that text what has been corrected and when. They often will be able to recognize their own power and authority when it comes to truth and informing the public. If you think about the role of journalists and news, it's very important. You're informing the public about the world around them. And those organizations that are considered trustworthy or reliable recognize that. And therefore, they are transparent about their work. Oftentimes, they're advertising, they're partners. They're essentially trying to show you exactly how they're doing things, why they're doing it, doing it that way, and what the effect is on you, the consumer of the news. 
So to give you an example of uh, transparency and what an ombudsman is, I'm going to now share my screen again. And I will take you to a new site. OK. So I went to cbc.ca slash news. This is where I tend to get most of my news from. And if you scroll down towards the bottom, you will see on the bottom right-hand side something called CBC Ombudsman. And right here, it says, read our journalistic standards and practices and see recent reviews by the ombudsman. If you click on this, and this is an example that I mean when I talk about transparency, when I talk about explaining what their process is, um, how they go about to doing their job, they're very clearly showing exactly how they deal with the news, how they create it, how they publish it, and how they interact with the public. So you have an option to make a complaint. You have um, the journalist standards and practices. You have an ombudsman here who is named. And actually, you have a photo as well. So this is an example of what I mean when I say there are generally basic standards and practices that you can check for in order to ensure that the organization that you're looking at follows or adheres to those practices, which tends to uh, make them more trustworthy and more reliable. Okay, so if there's no questions about that, oh, thank you, Hugh. <laughs> Most organizations will have it. Um, you're welcome. Uh, most organizations, uh, news organizations, do have it. Uh, sometimes it might be difficult to find the actual website. So a simple Google of CBC or CBS or CNN ombudsman will generally bring up some sort of page. Or standards and practices is another Google option. All right, so now that we've learned a little bit about aspects to evaluate on a page, I have three examples. I'm not going to tell you what kind of news they are. I'm hoping that we can all figure that out together. So I will start first with an article. Oh, let me share my screen first. There we are. OK. First article we're going to be looking at is called Hell's Angels, Bacchus Team Up to End Drug Abuse and Violence in the Maritimes. OK, so a couple things. I'm going to give you a little bit of time just to briefly read through the introduction. And then I'm going to ask for some things that you might have noticed. Or actually, I'm going to ask you first, do you think this is a real, credible news source? So I'll give you about a minute or two just to briefly skim the intro, and then we'll get into actual evaluation. Interesting, Tanya. Why do you think it is real so far? I'm going to scroll down just a little bit. Oh, interesting, Laura. <laughs> Elizabeth seems to know the website. Okay, definitely fake. 
I'll do a full in a, another minute or so. Another fake float. Okay, lots more fake coming in. Thank you, Tan thank you, Tanya. I appreciate that. It's always good to be honest. Okay, Janet, fair point. This is something that's been in the news recently, so it might lean more towards real. Okay, so I know you haven't probably been able to really read this in depth. But I am going to do a quick poll. Uh, if you can use the hands up option again, who thinks that this article is real? That one. Okay. And I'll ask just for the sake of asking, who thinks that this article is fake? Lots more. Okay. All right. Well, what I will say is that this is not necessarily fake news. I deliver. I was mean. <laughs> I deliberately had the top banner from you. Um, it will roll over in a second, I believe. This is a website called The Manatee. And if you think about The Onion, which is a satire website from, uh, ah, Hugh, there you are, yes. Uh, the Manatee is basically like a Maritimes version of The Onion. It is a satire website. So, well, certainly, it's, and this is why sometimes it's difficult, because it is talking about the Hells Angels, Bacchus. These groups have been in the news recently, and in PEI, they've actually been in the news for causing some trouble there. However, there are some things, and I believe it was Laura who mentioned it. Um, let me just scroll back up. Yes, Laura, uh, she said, based on them quoting Matt Power, a heavily tattooed Hell's Angel spokesperson. So a couple things to point out here. First of all, you are talking about uh, biker gangs who are traditionally into things like drugs. Um, the idea of them teaming up to end drug abuse in violence in maritime is slightly ironic. If you also consider some of the people that have been cited or sourced in this article, you have Matt Power, a heavily tattooed Hells Angels spokesperson. Um, you have Butch Marlowe. Uh, saying, we considered simply staying in our hometown of St. John, but we heard about PEI's growing drug culture. We knew we had to step up and do some good in the world. So again, they're trying to play up the ironic factor in this scenario. And um, as we scroll down even further, this potentially is maybe the biggest uh, sign. And I know, again, you guys weren't able to read it fully, but uh, this is an RCMP officer, supposedly named Ron Versloot. And the last thing he says quoted in this article is, and don't I look freaking cool in this jacket, he says, showing off a black leather with trademark angels logo. Admit it, I look cool. I think it's safe to say that any RCMP officer who wears a Hells Angel jacket and talks about it in an interview is probably going to get fired. So again, these are some of the irony factors, and it does require more careful reading than I gave you, so that's on me. But um, Another aspect or another way to figure out exactly what's happening here, we have the manatee. Um, you can actually, and let me just go to the manatee.net, and you might not be able to see it. The you know, screen is narrow, but typically what it says is somewhere along here, it'll say something about uh, the Maritime's favorite um, satirical website. 
I don't think it will show up here. Ah, down here. Disclaimer, all content, et cetera, et cetera, is fictitious and satirical and should not be taken seriously. So again, most uh, satire websites will be very clear in some place, generally towards the bottom, because uh, they do like to catch people initially, but generally towards the bottom of the page, they will actually be clear that something is satire or uh, a parody. So that was the first article to look at, and you all did pretty well, so congrats on that. We are going to move on to the second article, and this is about Donald Trump. Donald Trump protester speaks out. I was paid $3,500 to protest Trump's rally. So I'm going to scroll down some. This is from ABC. So, again, skim the article, see if there's anything in there that stands out to you, or skim the website itself and see if anything stands out to you as being real, fake, satire, etc. You guys are too quick for me. <laughs> yeah, you saw it right away, didn't you? Okay, so there's really probably no point in uh, in going too much further. Um, yes, so you guys all caught on very, very quickly. You immediately went to the URL, and you saw that it, instead of abcnews.com, and there is the pernicious ads that are everywhere, it's abcnews.com.co. So that is the very first thing to check out, and you were all very smart, and you did that. Um, so yes, this is a fake news website that obviously uh, plays off ABC News proper. Um, if you do want to do a quick check, you can just Google ABC News. And you'll see, actually, their URL is abcnews.go.com. So there is a slight difference there. And this is what that looks like. So going back to the article, there are more aspects to it that if for some reason you didn't get the URL at first, um, there are several linked um, articles within this. And I can tell you, having gone through it, that um, most of them are presented as fairly inaccurate. Um, the actual content of these articles that are, if you look down at the URL, down showing up down here, um, CNN.com, what else do we have, WashingtonPost.com. So they're going back to what sounds like pretty reputable sources, and they are. But when you actually click on the news source itself, it's generally not saying what this article is claiming it's saying, which is a problem and another aspect of fake news. Um, I'm, I'm not seeing any... Oh, you know, I'm not, I was going to say, I'm not seeing any ads just because I have ad blocker on. Let me turn that off for you so that you can actually see any ads that might show up here. I will disable and I will refresh. Oh, good. I'm already going into an ad. And it has now just tried to attack my computer. So, <laughs> <laughs> you see what fake news websites can do to you, <laughs> thanks to me. <laughs> um, so I will get out of that. But uh, you see that um, fake news can be uh, a bit sketchy at times. Thank God I have Norton, otherwise I'd be in trouble. Um, yeah, so you all did very well on that. Um, there's very aspects various aspects you could have looked at, but the, the killer right there was the um, URL that was clearly fake. So good job on that one. Now, this is the final source to look at, and this is from the Globe and Mail. And again, I'm going to turn off. I'm pretty sure this is not going to attack my site. Globe and Mail generally is pretty reputable. Let's see that. Okay. All right, so the third article, again, I will give you uh, a little bit of time just to skim through it and to take a look at some of the surrounding aspects of the site. 
and determine what kind of article this is. Ah, interesting comment, Elizabeth. Sometimes it's a little bit harder to spot than others. I will scroll down some. Does anyone have an initial guess of what kind of article this might be? Good point, Tanya. It'd be smart to check to see if the doctor named in the article is actually a doctor, a real one. Hugh, thank you, Laura, okay. Anyone else with thoughts? Real, fake, anything in between? Real, thank you, Alyssa. Megan, okay, you and Hugh have the same concern. Janet, thank you. Ah, Tanya, good spot there. So what this is, is a sponsored advertisement. Um, I did scroll down fairly quickly, so you might have missed this, but at the very top of this article, is the header sponsor content. Now it's not very bold, it's not you know flashing lights at you, but it is there. So this is the Globe and Mail attempting to indicate what kind of article this is. What you also should notice is there is no author anywhere attached to this article. So there is no person named as having written it. All it says is content from AJ. So it's not actually specifying exactly who wrote this. It's simply saying it's coming from something called aging, whatever might, that might be. So scrolling down, and this is where it gets a little bit more complicated, and you really have to look at this, is who actually is sponsoring this article? Um, a couple people, I know Hugh mentioned it, and I think it might have been Tanya, down at the bottom. In italics, there's this uh, little blurb. This content was produced by Randall Anthony Communications in partnership with the Global Mail's advertising department. The Globe's editorial department was not involved in its creation. So as soon as you see something that says advertising department and that the editorial department was not involved, you can be fairly certain in thinking that this was actually simply an ad, that it was not a, a real piece of journalism, shall we say. Now the question is, who benefits from this ad? Who's paying for it, essentially? It's saying this content is produced by Randall Anthony Communications, but that sounds like a PR firm of some sort. That's not really telling us about the actual company. So this is a little bit more difficult to um, determine, but what you can notice throughout the entire article, and I'll fully admit, this took me a while to figure out who actually was sponsoring this. Throughout the article, 
um, you will notice that McMaster University is being named multiple times. You have a professor at McMaster, and I think, I can't remember who it was, but someone, maybe it was Tanya, said it's good to confirm that this is an actual professor, an actual doctor. If you Google him, you will see that coming up at McMaster, it does appear to be an actual faculty profile of a person at McMaster University. So that does hold up. If you go back to the article, however, again, it's basically focused on, focusing on his research up to do with Parkinson's. And back up at the top of the page, you scroll over slightly, there's a fairly prominent ad from McMaster University introducing the McMaster Institute for Research on Aging. And you notice that the content here is from aging. So putting two and two together, I think it's fairly safe to say that McMaster University paid for this content through the Globe and Mail. And the Globe and Mail published it. Because as you can imagine, the Globe and Mail has a fairly wide audience. If you click on this ad, it will take you to a website all about the work that McMaster is doing. So this is a sponsored ad. Um, it is content that has been paid for. So this is something, I mean, everything that's in here sounds really good, right? It sounds academic. It sounds professional. They're using um, higher vocabulary. They're talking about a research activity that an academic would be interested in. However, this is not something that you would ever want to um, use in a research paper. First, it's, it's not peer review, so that is an aspect to consider. But also, this is coming from a place of advertisement rather than a place of academic research. Advertising, inevitably, there is a goal behind that, and that goal generally is for you to consume um, or interact with someone else's content, product, whatever it might be. Whereas research, the best research is there simply for the sake of research. So this is something to consider. Um, this is another type of article that you will encounter when you do search, uh, whether it be in your regular everyday life or whether it does come down to when you're searching for your school or university uh, research needs. OK, any questions on that? Okay, we will move on. So this is probably the hardest question of the evening, and that is how do you actually combat the spread of fake news? And there is really no easy answer. There's a simple answer, but there's no easy answer. The simple answer is your critical thinking skills. The hard part about that is that it takes time. It does take time to evaluate what you're reading. It takes time to check in to facts, whether that be Googling the author, whether that be checking on the publication, whether that means checking a fact-checking site. Uh, things like Snopes, factcheck.org, politifact.com. There's several of them out there that exist just to fact-check events, people, things happening on the internet. And all of those are very important and worthy activities. They do take time, though. So it's not as simple as scrolling through Twitter and doing a, a simple um, retweet and then never thinking about it again. And part of that is also the reason why fake news sometimes is easy to, um, to kind of proliferate is because we oftentimes want to believe the things that we see. Again, this goes back to the issue of online filter bubbles. Um, we are constantly seeing things that tend to reaffirm the way that we think about ourselves or about our communities or even about the world. And so it makes it easier to believe that what we're seeing is an accurate representation of the world around us. And so there's, that's some time we have to ask yourself some hard questions of if you actually do want to believe the article you're reading, 
why is that? Does it reaffirm something in your personal beliefs, your political beliefs, your moral beliefs, whatever it might be? If that's the case, it may purposely be trying to do so. It may purposely be trying to make you feel anger or a sense of injustice or being put upon in order for you to um, further share this story that potentially could be untrue. So all of these things, again, as I said, takes time, it takes evaluation, it takes some careful thought. So the best case scenario is that if you don't have time to evaluate, just don't share or don't repost. Um, there will probably be lots of people who will do it for you, unfortunately. Um, but at least you can be aware of what's happening around you and you can be very conscious of your own responsibility to ensure that good, trustworthy, reliable news is being shared. Because as we've seen, fake news, bad news, this all does have real world consequences. And um, oftentimes we talk about how young people are not able to differentiate between fake news and real news. But the reality is that adults have a very, very difficult time as we've seen. Um, so I would just try to be responsible with how you interact on the internet with news, with information. Um, certainly, being at university, we're very privileged to have um, some fairly well-developed critical thinking skills. So I would very much encourage you to put those into practice and to really think about how you engage with the information that you encounter online and, of course, in person. Um, our lives don't stop online or offline. They're all very, uh, very continuous. So. That is uh, the easy and the hard thing to do when it comes to uh, combating the spread of fake news. So I do just want to say thank you to you all. You did very well tonight. Um, and I, I do have some further resources um, that I would recommend if you're interested, um, things on how to spot fake news, uh, some little tips and tricks similar to the ones that I showed you tonight as well as just talking with the reliability, the credibility, trustworthiness of different sources. Um, are there any questions? OK. Well, thank you all very much. You've all been wonderful. And thank you for participating. I really appreciate it. Um, this recording will be available probably in a few hours on Moodle if you would like to review it or if you want to tell other people about it, that'd be wonderful. Um, oh, thank you, you. Oh, I'm Lindsay. I'm Lindsay McCollum. I uh, work at the library. So if you do want to follow up with me, please just come to the library circulation desk and I will do my best to help you or to sign your sheet or whatever you might need for the Learning Passport program. All right, thank you all. So if that is it, then I will let you go. Have a good night. And hopefully we will see you back here. Is, uh, Megan, you can um, uh, email, if you're a distance student, you can ah. email the... Uh, Let me the just type in my email address. And for those of you that have had sessions with me, Denise, I am sending you your sheet. Sorry, I got a little bit behind. That's my email address. I will address. be sending them out. And uh, feel free to email that form to me. Thank you. I'm not actually, I'm at home. Um, and I won't be in tomorrow either, unfortunately. But I will be in about 8.30 on Wednesday. 8.30 AM, I should say. That'd be perfect. I will be there.
Yep, I'll be there all morning, really. Um, afternoon, I have a few meetings, but someone can always grab me from those meetings as well if you're there in the afternoon. Great. Um, you can get the learning passport stamp from me at the library. Um, as I was mentioning, I will be there Wednesday morning. If you'd like to stop by the uh, library circulation desk and ask for me. If you are a distance student, then uh, you can simply email me that. And my email is up further on, yes, Wednesday morning, I'll be there. So you can simply ask for me, Lindsay, and I'll come up and sign your, your form for you. <laughs> That's when we'll know that we've made it. Uh, Wednesday morning, basically anytime 8.30 to noon, uh, I'll be available. So hopefully that will work for you. If not, then uh, I'm also available at times during the afternoon as well. Sure. Let me just type it in. So that's my email. You're welcome. No problem. And then there were two. <laughs> I really enjoyed the session. All right. So it's, uh, it's a wrap. <laughs> Have a good night, Lindsay.